today, uh, White Wave Judd's Room would like to uh, uh, welcome Porter Bibb. Happy to be here. And Ira Harris is with us, and we're just going to have kind of a rolling conversation about life, politics, and we'll see where it goes. Okay. Porter, why don't you tell everybody a little bit about your background, and then they can get a flavor for what you've done in your life. Okay, well, I'm the ultimate dilettante. Um, I'm a so-called financial advisor these days, and with my wonderful trading wife, Alexandra. We run MediaTek Capital Partners and do a lot of uh, strategic investment. Um, mostly these days, believe it or not, in China, where I've been doing business for some 40 years. But before that happened, I, I uh, was first a White House correspondent for Newsweek magazine. Then I was the first publisher, not editor, Jan Winter would get very upset if he heard that I was advertising myself as the first editor of Rolling Stone, but I was the publisher. Uh, and I brought Hunter Thompson, my childhood friend from Louisville, Kentucky, uh, in and made him Rolling Stone's first White House correspondent <laughs> in the <laughs> era. Uh, that, that was the biggest hurdle and probably the most interesting and gratifying challenge that I overcame as the head of Rolling Stone. Uh, and after that, I uh, gravitated uh, to uh, Newsweek again, where I uh, left the editorial side because I had lunch with the CEO one day and asked him how much I could get if I were on the business side. And it turned out it was about four times as much as I was making as a reporter. So I became the head of uh, Newsweek's 32 international editions. And that took me to China because I, I moved the, uh, the printing operation of their Asian editions from Tokyo to Hong Kong and decided to go to Beijing uh, when I was as, as close as Hong Kong puts you to, to the capital of China. Uh, and in 1968, I, I put my job at Newsweek on line and uh, offered Mao Zedong's uh, government 500 free subscriptions to Newsweek because they had no access to Western media. And this was seen by me at least as a coup against time, which was our major competitor in the, in the region. Um, I was wondering who was gonna pay for those 500 free subscriptions to to Mao and his buddies in Beijing, but uh, they kind of applauded when I got back to New York and said that was a, a really interesting coup, Porter. Um, what are you going to do next? <laughs> 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 I, I decided to go into documentary filmmaking and became the third Maisel's brother with Albert and David Maisel's, who in my estimation were among the world's greatest documentary filmmakers at the time. Both of them, unfortunately, are no longer with us, but we made about uh, a dozen major documentaries. We won the Venice Film Festival with a documentary called Salesman about door-to-door -door Bible salesmen. And then we made Altamont's uh, concert with the Rolling Stones and 12 other bands uh, following the Woodstock band, uh, concert. and. Gimme Shelter was that movie, and it's today, um, along with Woodstock, a classic uh, of the 1960s. I always think of Gimme Shelter as the dark underbelly of uh, the 60s because it was uh, a totally free concert with a half a million people in the middle of nowhere in Northern California, and we only had uh, one, one death and, and two births. But um, after, after that, uh, I, I gravitated to Wall Street and um, ended up working for Bankers Trust. And they, I was one of three people who started their investment banking division. And we did, in five years, over 300 media and technology transactions for the bank and put them on the map. Uh, and then we all left. <laughs> I, I was for 16 years 
uh, the head of investment banking at uh, Ladenburg Thalman. And that's when I really revved up my interest in China, which was quite early. And now we're talking about the early 1980s. In 1980 uh, itself, I, I funded and built the uh, first commercial film animation studio in China. And uh, we, it was a huge success. And we sold it eight years later to our biggest customer, who was Disney. And I, at that time, uh, when we built that, that studio, I always like to tell the, my Chinese friends, the, uh, the, the studio hired 400 young Chinese animators. And outside the building in Shenzhen, where we were located, were 400 bicycles. Eight years later, when we sold the company, there were 40 bicycles and 212 automobiles. And that's, that's the best graphic I can give you of the, the changing fortunes of uh, the Chinese economy, in, in the, it's, which began its skyrocket rise in the early 80s. Uh, I, I went back uh, with a client last year to Shenzhen. Uh, a client had an uh, investor conference. And, and get this. In China, investor conferences, shareholder conferences are uh, like circuses. And w my client rented the Shenzhen Sports Stadium. We had 25,000 people in, in uh, the Shenzhen Sports Stadium. I had to address, not speaking one word of Mandarin, uh, these people, and they, they wanted to know uh, what I thought of Shenzhen. I said, well, when I was here first 40 years ago, uh, the population was barely 5,000. Today it's 18 million, and uh, it keeps getting bigger every minute. Shenzhen is uh, mind blowing if any of you have ever been there. When you see it's the headquarters of most of the tech companies, it's like the Silicon Valley of China, and it, it is mind blowing. It's, it, it's so transformed over the years, and it's still growing like crazy. Anyway, that's, that brings me up to the present. And if, if Ira is there, uh, I'm, I've always uh, thought Ira was about 50 years older than I am. And it turns out we're both geezers of, of the same vintage. But uh, if he's there, I'm happy to uh, dialogue with him. And I have to tell you guys, one of the things that I admire about Ira Harris is not his financial acumen particularly, but the fact that he and his wife <laughs> have a college football coach position named for themselves because they contributed $10 million. I'm here. I listen to every count. <laughs> okay, over to you. Ira, can you hear us? Ira, have we lost you already? He's probably trying to find another coach's position. He, he can name after himself. Well, I think he got lost in his daughter's house and he lost his connection. Not, not hard to do these days. Why don't you talk a little bit about sort of the media world now because that's really been your beat, so to speak. That's true. I, I, Everyone thinks you're a media analyst, which you're not. But you've been on CNBC and Bloomberg and many of the uh, fin shows. So perhaps you can share a little bit of yeah. Well, about I, media. I, I used to think I used to think I knew a lot about the media because I'd spent my lifetime um, doing deals and running media companies. I I, I started Us Magazine, Us Weekly for the New York Times. Um, what, as was mentioned, I was the first publisher of Rolling Stone. I've actually launched and published uh, about uh, eight other magazines. And um, <laughs> what, what I now wake up every morning uh, dreading is what horrible transformation is going on in the media world that I don't understand because it for the last 10 years with, with uh, streaming and digital, everything is up for grabs and, and changing radically. Um, the, 
the streaming revolution took a long time to take off, and it, it, it surprised me that it it, it was uh, so arduous for these big companies. But uh, un, uh, unlike uh, Netflix, which spent last year eighteen billion dollars on new content, these other companies felt they had to buy companies like Fox or Time Warner or whomever um, to be in the streaming business. And, and Netflix proved that you can make it; you don't have to buy it. But the business uh, formula for these businesses is still uh, unknown. Is Disney Plus, which looks like it's a, a, a real threat to me. Judd? Yeah, yes. Okay, you can hear me. I, I, got I can hear you. And now I think Porter just dropped out. Oh, okay. I was getting buffered. I, he, you know, he's confusing me with your, with your Ira Harris, the other one. Oh, with Jay Ira Harris. With Jay, yeah. So let's, we have to straighten that out. Not that that's one, not to, you know, that's okay. Except uh, he don't know shit about global macro. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But it's hey, Doug, maybe you want to open up uh, questions maybe from your your uh, audience here. And okay. they can ask Ira and it, they can ask Porter. I'll see Porter. what happens to Porter. Wait, Porter, is Porter there? I, I think Porter got dropped. Let me go see what's going on with him. I'll be right back. Now, is Porter Alexandra's husband? Judd? Yes. Judd. Yeah. Is Porter Alexandra's husband? Yes. Oh. I didn't know that she was that old. She's not. M meaning over 50. <laughs> she is, uh, yeah, she's his wife. They've, um, I'm not sure how long they've been married, but they've been together quite a while. And, uh, yeah, I mean, Porter's just had an amazing life. So, um, yeah, TP, we're going to get to that when he gets, we get, gets back in here. Um, and Michael, if you've got any questions too, because he spent a lot of time in China. I mean, uh, you know, I, I had the privilege of meeting having a couple of drinks with Porter a few years ago in New York. It was great. And, you know, the only thing that bothered me about Porter cause was his waistline is still what it was, I think, when he was in high school. Which I can't say that about the rest of us. So let's see if Penn can get him back in. Yeah, Bosco, Porter did write that book about Ted Turner. That was one of the subjects we were talking about Turner and Buddy Malagas and all the other sailors when we were having a beer together. Okay, Mike, well, we'll, we'll we're gonna ask okay. you then. I'm back. Okay, so he, here's a couple of the questions for her that we've got for you. Uh, given your vast experience in China, please share your thoughts on the Ch uh, China's debt bubble consumer real estate, et cetera, discussed in the media, thanks. And then um, Michael, who is a, uh, who's a Chinese expat living in LA, was more interested in your views on American media complex now. Oh wait, Chad, make sure you explain to Porter that I'm not who he thinks I am. Oh, uh, Porter, are you there? I don't think he's back in yet. Let's see if we can get him back in and then. So we lost him about two minutes ago. 
Let's see if he can come back in. Yeah, they they, they live in uh, on Long Island, out in the Hamptons. Hold on a second, I can pause it. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, where are we now? Is, is Ira back on? Yeah. I am. Okay, Ira's back on. Here's the deal. So we're, I, I'm going to help out a little bit. So TP asked, Porter, given your vast experience in China, can you share your thoughts on the China's debt bubble, consumer, real estate, et cetera, discussed in the media? Thanks. And then Ira, maybe you can hop in there too. You guys can have a conversation about it. Who goes first? You. <laughs> you. That was directed towards you. I, I, you guys uh, obviously are, are watching what's happening with the, the new uh, star exchange in China. Their, their, their tech exchange uh, is exploding right now. And um, I, I will always put my money on China versus anybody else in the world because a strong central government beats a democracy in finance any day. Uh, we, may, we may be heading toward a strong central government here, the way they're giving away money in Washington, but in, it, it, for 25 years, I've, I've wrestled with the, the debt problems that the Chinese banks have had, and it just gets bigger and bigger every year. Uh, they seem to fixate on real estate as the one, one uh, investment that uh, the government is never going to let disappear, and and with good reason because what what's happened is they built over the last 25 to 30 years a middle class of now 500 million people out of the 1.3 billion total population in China. But every year, hundreds of millions of people from poor parts of the country gravitate to the cities, and they all need places to live, and that keeps buoying the real estate market. And that's going to continue uh, unless and until the people in that middle class, the five, six hundred million people, which it will be in the next couple of years, uh, if, they, if they don't continue to enjoy a better uh, way of living and a better income, uh, things are going to go a little difficult for Beijing. But as long as, uh, as uh, the average individual in China continues to... to see a better life every year for himself and his family, um, they will put up with any, any kind of government. And what's really remarkable is wherever you go in China, it's really, really, really hard to find somebody who will criticize Beijing because they enjoy the improvements that, that uh, the economy and, and, the, and they look to the government uh, as having been the provider and enabler of that uh, phenomenal economic historic economic uh, improvement. I, I think that uh, there was a very telling uh, uh, piece uh, uh, in, in the papers this morning about the difficulty that U.S. companies will have in trying to decamp from China. That's what you keep hearing about people who are moving their supply chain elements to Thailand or to other parts of Southeast Asia, the Philippines, Vietnam, they can't come close to having the efficiency and the smooth running operations that they, they enjoyed in China. And they also don't, don't want to walk away from the largest uh, consumer market in the world. So I, I, we've got a long, long road ahead of us in terms of uh, reestablishing uh, compatible relationships. But that will happen. Uh, and, and China investment and China capital markets and China finance is going to be something that we all have to deal with uh, increasingly every day. Okay, Porter, a question for you. So who are your top three picks of China, uh, public Chinese companies that trade here in the US? Well, I have to go with, with I love Jack Ma. Uh, I, in 1991, uh, I, I I had Jack Ma in my office, and he was looking for $10 million to uh, in, uh, enlarge his uh, 
directory of uh, Chinese manufacturers that he had online uh, to offer American manufacturers a cheaper, better way of uh, making goods uh, for less money. And I said, Jack, this is a really, really clever idea. However, there's no barrier to entry. And if you're successful, there are going to be a thousand people who co uh, compete with you and, and duplicate what you're doing. Well, uh, that was probably the worst business decision I've ever made in my life, not, not putting the $10 million into Alibaba in 1991. Um, I, lo I love that company. I think that Alipay, their uh, uh, fintech uh, uh, subsidiary, is extraordinary and is, is, uh, it's not listing here, but it, it's in Star in Shanghai and the Hong Kong Exchange, and it's going to explode. Uh, obviously, uh, ten cent is also good, um, and, and the, the the interesting thing about ten cent is how uh, how strong they are in the rest of the world, but they they, they really have never been able to succeed in getting a, a, a monetary foothold in the United States. That's going to change because they they are so large and so smart and uh, and so determined that they're not going to walk away from this market. Uh, I, I like them. I, I, I think you got to look at, at uh, ByteDance because it's very likely that U.S. investors are going to buy that company out, out of uh, the parent because the parent has uh, too close a relationship with Beijing. Uh, but I, I would say that if, if, if ByteDance and, and TikTok stay uh, public, that's where I put a lot of my money. Okay, so I mean, who was the company uh, that you mentioned before TikTok? Sounded like White Fence, but I didn't quite get it. Ten, ten cent. T e n c e n t. Yeah, so it's Alipay and Financial. Uh, uh, all going uh, public soon in, in Hong Kong. Yeah. Uh, Alibaba has just gone uh, public about a month ago in Hong Kong. Um, I, I, I think that uh, Trump is serious about um, kicking all of the Chinese companies listed here on uh, the New York and, and NASDAQ uh, out of the country. Uh, he can't kick them out of the country, but he can take them off the, the exchanges, and uh, that's likely to happen. And then probably uh, that will actually uh, help them and make them uh, even better investments in, in other markets. Because they're not going to go away from the United States in, in terms of their business. They just lose the, the, uh, the listing. What do you think about the big tax? What do you think about? Um, well, you got you got to. I'm on the board of uh, the most uh, putatively the most uh, uh, prestigious and important um, artificial intelligence machine learning think tank in Europe called ISI. They are the official EU um, artificial intelligence consultant advisors. Um, I think that. <laughs> We haven't even begun to see what what uh, big tech is going to be able to deliver over the next five years in terms of new products and whole new business models. And what, one of the most interesting things, you know, what a trial uh, COVID-19 testing is in, in this country right now. But uh, Apple and a couple of other companies are working on watches and, and phones that will provide you within 30 seconds a, a, a complete COVID-19 test for blood pressure, for um, all, all the vital signs that, that uh, a test is, uh, needs to give you an analysis of whether you're positive or negative. Um, it, it's, it's interesting that, that uh, the pharma uh, sector is, is struggling with um, with, with a virus, trying to find a virus. And, and that's because historically, no, nobody has ever found a successful virus in, in less than a couple of years. 
And um, I think it's still going to take a couple of years, but it's the testing and the other medical devices that are really important. We, we, we found a, a, a ventilator system uh, in the UK, for example, that cost about 10% of what the ventilators that are now being used in the United States and most of the rest of the world, and they're much more effective and less intrusive and, and uh, can be, can be manufactured, mass produced anywhere in the world. And, and I'm just waiting for, we, we, we've got uh, a, a special interest in that company, which came out of Bridge University. And right now it looks like Oxford University is in the lead in, in, in developing a viable uh, vaccine. But uh, big tech, um, crazy valuations, but they actually rule the world. And the rest of us are going to have to get in line and, and, and understand where technology is going because they're changing not just the, the, the social fabric, but the economic uh, structure uh, of the way that we live and work and, and, uh, and invest. And another question for you, what do you think about this $765 million loan that is uh, the government made to Kodak? to start drug production. Well, I have to tell you that- and, and I only say this because Porter used to be on the board of Eastman House. He yes. was, was close to the Kodak people. So um, clearly <laughs> had a lot of issues. You're hitting, you're hitting close to home because we, with, uh, with some significant uh, investor partners, uh, were in the midst of announcing a takeover <laughs> of Kodak. Um, they, they bought Sterling Drug about uh, 12, 13 years ago, uh, Kodak did, and that gave them a modicum of, of expertise in, in drug manufacturing. They don't have, Sterling made the simplest aspirin and, and non-prescription pain pills and lots of junk pharma but uh, it gave Kodak an interest, entrance into the, the pharma world and this three quarters of a billion dollar loan that the government has, has given them uh, remains to be seen. A, whether they can produce any anything that is going to be relevant to COVID-19 uh, and, and B, whether they can ever pay uh, the loan back because the, the loan comes with the stipulation that um, they, they have to pay the same price that everybody else, international um, uh, pricing rates for the vaccine. That, that's something the World Health Organization and most major governments are all uh, coming together on. They, they, they don't want to have one country gouge everybody else or, or uh, hoard the, the vaccine if it works. And I, I'm not sure Kodak is, is going to benefit from this, this move, but it sure shot the stock right through the roof this morning. Okay, we have another question. So Michael, uh, Porter, based on your past experience and success doing business in China, do you agree that a foreign business person have, will have to buddy up with the CCP in order to be successful? Besides along the process, do you think a business person needs to give up some of the American ideological aspects? Well, the, the, the best guy to answer that question is not me. It's Larry Fink at BlackRock. Um, he's, he and, and uh, Morgan Stanley and a couple of other major financial companies uh, last year got permission to uh, operate in China uh, with, with absolutely no ties or constraints uh, in, introduced by the government and no partners. Uh, that, that was an historic business breakthrough, and uh, I think that that's going to continue. Um, the, the, the issue of, uh, uh, of, of technology transfer and technology theft uh, is an old issue right now, and it's very likely that we'll, we'll be on the stealing side rather than uh, being stolen from, because China has... The, here's something that nobody talks about. There are 5,000 PhDs in the, the technical sector graduating every single year from Chinese universities. And most of them are as smart, if not smarter than the same uh, equivalent uh, graduates from US and European uh, universities. 
but they're flooding the world with technology and the, co the government has made a huge commitment to 5G and to AI and, and to uh, the electric uh, car industry. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a question of uh, a couple of years before China owns the automotive industry worldwide because they're, they're miles ahead of anybody in the, in the EV world, including Tesla. Well, Porter, I would say that you just made the market go green, but I'm sure it was Ira Harris and not you. <laughs> I have yes, Alexander. That's because I haven't said anything, so the market found a reason to rally. Yes, you're right. <laughs> no, I think you're pushing it up. No, no, not me, not me. You but, guys live by the charts. I I try to live by fundamentals, and I'm old hat in that respect. Full disclosure: Porter is not a trader. <laughs> that's, that's for sure. All right, Ira, it's all, it's all yours Porter, What about now. the Chinese and high? Porter, what about the Chinese and hydrogen cells? Uh, I, I, I lost you there. You see them as being big cells? Huh? Yeah, hydrogen fuel cells and the Chinese. What do you, well, what that, do you that, 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 that's a, a, a major issue that uh, most of the people in Washington haven't been paying attention to. I think it's going to be huge and, and very important. And it's, it's, it's going to shake up not only the, 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 the gas industry, but it, the whole energy sector is, is going to suffer. Uh, because China, um, as, as you guys probably know, they, they're doing deals with Russia, with uh, India, even though they're a little bit at odds with India right now on um, new energy uh, technologies and um, we, we all look to, to China as being uh, the, the biggest customer for uh, US energy, oil and gas. And that's, that's not happening and it's not going to happen. And it's gonna leave a lot of producers in this country uh, with unsold product. If you watch what, what, what China, and they have the benefit uh, in, in innovation because they, they're starting from zero in so many of these areas. I mean, you saw that they just launched a, uh, a Mars probe, which, which has taken them 20 years to catch up to US and Russia. But once they, they get on track and once, once they start making a move, they don't stop. And they don't have the constraints that, that uh, we do, and certainly that Russia does uh, financially. Um, we're, we're, we're resorting to private enterprise now to put our, our uh, space elements in, uh, up there in the cosmos. They don't have to do that in China. They, they have a gigantic equivalent of NASA that's government funded and just gets bigger every day. Okay, and we have another question from Peter, who's one of my favorite people here. Sorry, everybody, but he is. Um, he, Peter wants to know, um, is Tesla going to be played in China or forced to the agenda of China, forced to conform to China's agenda, and even in a way become a Chinese company? The, the problem, I, I, I don't think the latter is gonna happen. The market uh, conditions and, mar and market constraints are going to impact uh, Tesla. They, they're doing quite well. I give them a lot of credit for getting manufacturing up and running and, and sales are, are actually happening of Tesla. But they're at the high end. They're at the super luxury end of the car market in China. And there, there are 20 companies that are making EVs that cost a, a half or a quarter of what uh, Tesla has, has to get to make a profit. And so they, they, they're going to end up uh, being the Lamborghini or the Maserati of the EV sector in China. They will never be a mass market company. Okay, hey, Port, there's another question from TP. Um, he would like to know, do you have thoughts on potential outcome as China battles the U.S. for reserve currency status? <laughs> China owns us. <laughs> and and it, it, it's always amazed me that they, they have, they, the government in Beijing has never really uh, made any kind of uh, hint that uh, they, 
because of the, the trillions of dollars of T bills that they, they hold, that they, they are not going to use those and weaponize them. Um, I, it's, it's, I don't think that you're going to, going to find that as a, as a big issue going forward. I think China, China it has uh, something that uh, we overlook. They, of course, they, they got big because of exports, but they've now got a, a, a huge middle class and domestic middle class. And that, that, it's booing the economy right now with, with the trade wars that, that we're in the middle of and they're probably going to get a little more intense and, and restrictive going forward. Um, but they, my, my, my percept, I'm not a, uh, I don't have any inside information on the economic uh, decision making that, that Beijing is going to uh, undertake. But since they, their history is not to rock the boat in that respect, and I think that's going to be something they want to continue, not rocky. So, uh, uh, Alexandra, this is Ira. Can I, let me follow up the question. I would ask Porter about that, and I think people will be interested in. So, in order though to become more established as a reserve currency, do you see them going to somewhat of a uh, gold-backed or silver-backed uh, currency initially to gain credibility on the uh, international scene? Alexander, are you going to answer that? <laughs> That's not a question for Alexandra. That was a question for Porter Gitt. Okay. <laughs> My answer is, uh, if it's lithium back, look out. Okay. All right. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I think it, they're a long way away from uh, a, a gold or silver back uh, um, reserve. But hey. lithium is going to be a really uh, integral and, and critical factor. Uh, so, so I should get long Glencore mining because they're oh, um, yeah. uh, Alma Mali. But look, look down there in Chile, where uh, yeah. Chile and Argentina are sitting on uh, the, the biggest deposits of lithium in the world, and uh, everybody's talking about EV in in every kind of mode of transportation and and vehicle, and you can't do that without lithium. So th that's that's. That's a very significant development prospect. Okay, I want you guys to keep on talking because you're pushing the market up. Even Last, you're grinding it, you are we're doing, it up. We're doing our best. Good. But, Porter, la last week in the FT, there was a, an op-ed piece by uh, Yi Geng. I'm listening. I lost you. Am I still on? You're still on, Judd. Is Ira here still? Ira? Uh, Ira faded out. I see him. Uh, there he is. Governor like of the Bank of China. Oh, you can't hear me? Yeah, oh, no. faded yeah. out, Ira. How about now? Better. Okay. So my, my question was to Porter. Last week, we had uh, Yi Gang wrote an op-ed piece in the FT. Ira, he just faded again. And he's the governor of the People's Bank of China talking about the need for increased SD. Now, that's in his miserable system in, in the hotel. Uh, uh, hello? Yeah, Ira, you got to restate that last part. Okay. So it was the piece by Governor uh, e. Gates of the People's Bank of China calling for increased issuance of SDR. I'm up to the issuance of, and then I can SDRs. Oh, okay. As yeah. the response to the COVID-19 beginning. So uh, I mean, certainly in China, we expect to hear more from that from over the coming years about those types of events because it does enhance China's uh, importance in the global. Right. I, I, yeah, I've been a. I, I'd have to say I'd applaud that that perspective. I'm not sure it's representative of, of uh, President Xi and his his uh, intentions, but definitely it's something that uh, I, I would applaud. I, I missed that uh, 
piece in the FT. I've got an FT shirt on today, so uh, bad on me for not, <laughs> not reading the, the same piece. Yeah, go, go back and find it. It was July 16th. I'll look, I'll look it up. Okay. It's a, it's a worthwhile, nobody really talked about it, but when, when he talks, so you got to sit up and listen because well, bet. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's it policy implications. And, and it, it, it may be that uh, he's just, he's floating that idea to see, uh, Beijing says, why don't you see what happens? What kind of response? And one of the curious responses that you just touched on is that uh, almost nobody in the West has picked up on that. I, I, it boggles, it, it does boggle my mind. And when I talk to people, if there's, you know, the Chinese, they have a, and, and I know you could speak to this very well, a long perspective of history. You know, I know the famous supposed exchange between Zhou Enlai and Henry Kissinger right. in 1971. But I, I will tell you something that's funny. Last August, I was supposed to have coffee with Sidney Rittenberg. Yeah. But he died. <laughs> I, I was a bad omen last, last August. Uh, Ira, you're a killer. I am a killer, yeah. And, and there's a man of great history. And being that you're so, you've been a giant, I'm sure you've, you've crossed paths with Rittenberg when he was much more vibrant, but he did pass last year. Here's what to watch out for in China that nobody's talking about. China actually is propping up North Korea right now. And, and, and the reason is that they don't want South Korea and the United States on, mainly the United States, to be put, put tens of thousands of, of U.S. troops uh, on the Chinese border for exercises and, and, uh, and, and maybe permanent residence. And so if I were Washington, I would be talking uh, to President Xi about loosening the ties that he has with North Korea. North Korea will, will drop off the face of Korea, of the peninsula, if China takes away its support. And nobody's doing anything about that right now. And you, you're never going to re reason uh, with North Korea, but you can definitely reason with, with China. And it's interesting, you know, that you're right, that the Chinese really value and, and respect history. And if you go back maybe a couple of thousand years, you'll find that China has never invaded another country. People will say, oh, well, what about Taiwan? What, what about uh, Hong Kong? They, they always try to get back what was once part of what they considered China to begin with. And uh, I don't ever see them uh, on the offensive, going going after any place in Southeast Asia or anywhere else, and that that's missing from our di our dialogue with uh, the Chinese. We can't say that we've never gone after third country, third party country. Uh, China can. Anybody well, here? I, I'm, yeah. I'm, okay. Well, good. then, then a follow-up question to that, you know, because in this we've talked many times, and, you know, in my position, this is Ira, on is that Hong Kong is a sideshow compared to the potential of what Taiwan means. Do you have any on that? I lost you. Judge, did you hear me? Uh, Ira was asking. Uh, he always thought that Hong Kong was a sideshow in comparison to what the real game is with Taiwan? Um, it's, yeah, I mean, in a way it is, but the, the one, one thing you have to realize is that the Beijing is, is ne never going to let Hong Kong collapse or, or go away as, as a place where Western finance is based. They, they need that gateway in and out of, of the mainland and they would lose significantly if they actually took over and, and, and just uh, eliminated all of the democratic elements of, of Hong Kong. 
uh, they, they still have 27 years under the agreement they have with the Brits. Uh, and I, they, they don't like the criticism that, that the protesters have, and it, it doesn't help uh, when, when uh, the young Hong Kongers and, and the U.S. stand up and say, let's make Hong Kong democratic. It's never going to be democratic. It, it, it was and is part of China. I mean, the Brits took it away from China, and the Chinese want it back. But, but it's from a financial and economic point of view, they, they need that gateway, that capital markets gateway that, that Hong Kong provides. And, and Jeff E asks, what about their tech offensive? The Chinese tech offensive, anybody? Ira Porter. Oh, well, what, 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 I, what was the question? What about the Chinese and their tech offensive? When you say tech offensive, you mean what? Uh, Huawei? Jeff, why don't you elaborate? I mean, there's no question that, that, that China is on track to be the world's tech leader going forward. That, that, that's an avowed goal that, that Beijing is very uh, uh, articulate about, but is it going to be five years or 10 years or 15 years? That, that's another issue. And how are we going to respond? Yeah, especially with their lead on quantum computing, which yeah. is very interesting beyond my pay grade, but interesting. Let, let me give you a uh, some insight. A, a good friend of ours is uh, John Huntsman, who was the ambassador uh, under Obama to China. And, and under Trump, he was ambassador to Russia. And I don't know anybody in the international or foreign service uh, spectrum who has a better uh, picture of what the future holds uh, for us internationally. And his, his attitude is my attitude about China. He says, we, we have to compete, but we also have to cooperate. And that's, that's probably the only sensible way to, for, these, to, for the China, for the PRC, and for the USA to grow going forward. We, we, we cannot give in. We have to compete hard and ferociously, but we also have to cooperate. One of the unfortunate uh, things that, that uh, is happening right now is the, 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 the Washington effort to uh, kick out of this country over 100,000 Chinese who are uh, teaching and studying at universities across the United States. Uh, that's, that's a really uh, un unfortunate loss of significant talent because many of them will we'll end up coming to work for U.S. companies and then, then going back uh, to, the, to the mainland. If the, and, but a huge portion of them, may, maybe 20 or 30 uh, percent, will stay here. And they're very, very smart. Um, you, you cannot imagine the, the level of talent and learning capabilities that it takes when you are competing against the millions of people who want a university education in China. Um, you have to be good, and it, it's their their system. You you can say it's woke. It's not a, a, a free form educational system, but they are really every every techie I've ever met from China is smart as a whip, and they are total workaholics. And I respect the way that they uh, conduct themselves and build their businesses because they don't look back. So there are a bunch of questions. So. Um... Let's see here. Sorry, don't mean to. I'm, I'm being the informal moderator, Judd. I hope you don't mind. Um, Bosco is asking, what about the Chinese lady being detained in Canada? That's Huawei. Um, she's the CEO. And also, um, TP asked, uh, what did he ask? Uh, asked about uh, what, what is that? Cooperation or co cooperation? Is that a word, TP? Is that a new word? You guys should just come on the, just, just unmute yourselves, guys. And yeah, just, just unmute now. 
I'm calling names now. TP, turn on your your uh, mic, please. Okay, so uh, TP. how about Michael? Ask Ira. Uh, no, it was just a comment to uh, uh, Iris. Um, the biggest quantum related stock in uh, Chinese markets uh, was, was called Keda Guodun. And it's, um, its business is re related to quantum communications. Yeah. And they just came out and said they don't have the tech. They, know, they, they have no customers. The technology is still in the uh, early development and it's not usable. And um, based on my research, the leading companies in quantum computing in the world is IBM and second to none, Google. That's all. That's two of the companies that in the world can make a practical or have hopes to make a practical quantum computer. Those are the only two. And there was no one Chinese company that is on the um, list. There's only two. That's it. I, I, I think you, you're, you're right up to a point, but um, look, look at what CERN has in Switzerland right now. Um, they, they, they are not a company, they're a cooperative, and they've got something on the quantum side that would certainly uh, equal anything that IBM is going to come up with. And, and it's not always the best technology that, that wins. Sometimes it's the second or third best. It's the, who gets to market and, and who, who is better at managing the, the development of the technology. We're still a, a bit of, of time away from the, the, the emergence of quantum as, as a major factor. And it's uncertain. I, probably I would put my money on Google on the commercial side right now, but um, what, what happens in China when they have a situation like the one you just described, where their, their technology doesn't work? They, they'll throw money and they'll throw talent at it from a government perspective. And we don't do that. We can't do that in, in, a, in a free economy. And, and at, the, at the end, that's, that's probably going to put China in the driver's seat sometime in the near future. Yeah, Porter, I agree with you. That's why I asked um, if a business person wants to succeed in China, does he need uh, to give up some of the uh, American ideologies? Because in a capitalism markets, um, we believe that markets can operate itself, right? right. right. Where there's need, some company or some group of guys will go to that need and develop for it instead of using <clears throat> a nation's power um, to push the market towards that direction. Is that correct? Yeah, you're absolutely right. And you know, the, we, we had the last uh, uh, White House technology director w was under Obama. The, the last four years, there, there's been nobody in, in senior level of government who has any knowledge or interest in developing technologies. And in China, they have hundreds of people in Beijing who are monitoring every tech sector uh, under the sun and, and watching what's happening, helping where help is needed, uh, trying, trying to keep companies uh, look, looking more or, or less like independent developing companies even though they're not really developing, or they're not independent, rather, sorry. And th that's the big difference, and that's, that's why if you're a betting man, you gotta put your money on China, because they're very serious about winning uh, the tech wars. Yeah, one thing I can be certain is that something, if they pushed it, and they came out of market, they will force everybody to use it. <laughs> yeah, well, they, they can. and and. And, and, and the, the man in the street 
is not going to complain as long as as he's his standard of living keeps getting better and better each year and yes the technology keeps getting better that that he is accessible to him so it's it's when the government fails to deliver that you're going to see a very serious change and probably a revolution at some point in china yeah so well just like uh cashless uh, society um, Alipay and WeChat Pay has been uh, used very wi widely. Um, maybe I would say 95% of the Chinese owns a cell phone that could uh, do wireless mobile payments. Right. Well, I mean, they, ca cash has been eliminated in China. You, you Basically, yes. <laughs> if you're a visitor to China and you, you don't have uh, access to a phone or, or some other digital device, you you can't even buy a newspaper because they don't take cash. Right. And basically, they've tied it to your um, the Chinese version of credit score system. And yeah, basically, your identity is reviewed whenever and wherever you use that uh, mobile payment system. That's right. There, there are two cultural and social factors that are worth watching in China. One, one is the fact that the Chinese historically, uh, because they've, they've been through such horrific uh, experiences over the years, they, they are the biggest savers in the world and always save for the future, for hard times. And that's dissipating now because pe people are spending their money. They're making so much money compared to what they were 20 years ago that they don't stop to save. The other thing that is really very nervous making about uh, China is the, the family system held the country together. Uh, every year, Chinese New Year, everybody goes in the whole country. They go back to their hometowns and, the, and their families and that has uh, they, they take the senior citizens, the grandparents, and the great grand grandparents, and they they are take taken care of uh, by the younger generation. That's going away because people have moved from their original homes and into the cities, and they now live in a one or two bedroom apartment. They don't have room for the grandmother or the grandfather, and that whole family structure was an anchor in Chinese society. And that's going away and, and, and disappearing completely. And that, that's something that you have to watch for because it, 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 it leaves the Chinese of today and the next generation tomorrow very vulnerable. They, they're losing the, the safety nets that, that they built for themselves in saving their income and in, in keeping the family as a family unit. Um, I hope I'm not taking too much of your time, but uh, I got this question that's been bothering me for years. That is the, uh, the media complex in the United States right now, the division between the left and the right. And there seems to be no middle ground. What's your view on that? Uh, as a former journalist, um, I am appalled at what's happened uh, in, in, in I, I wrote a book about Ted Turner and CNN, and uh, I look at CNN today, and this is a good example of the, what you're, you're bringing out. It's, it's an, an opinion network. I keep saying, where's the news? There's no news. It's, it's, you're either left or you're right. And uh, I, I, I see the same thing in, in the major newspapers and the magazines, and uh, to me, I, I think that what's happened is that the internet has be become the media of, of choice, medium of choice for, for the majority of the people because if you're a right winger, if you're conservative, if you're an evangelical, you're going to watch Fox. You're not going to watch CNN or MSNBC. If, if you're on the other side, you're never going to look at Fox. I look at all of the media and I am absolutely appalled at how biased and one-sided it is. And I, I, I also at one time was the first and last corporate development director the New York Times company ever had. And I, I made some major changes and acquisitions for the company. But 
they've gone back to be to desperately trying to keep the newspaper uh, going. And I love the new, the, a new woman just was appointed CEO two days ago. And she said, we are going to make the New York Times a world-class technology company, not a media company. And I clapped and cheered for that because she's got talent and she's got an audience and a, and a global brand. And that's a great platform for a technology company. I don't want to see them get into the, the fist fights, the social fist fights they do when they, they run some some article that's biased one way or the other, which they're doing too too frequently. You probably saw they, they hired a, uh, uh, a former Wall Street Journal editor woman uh, who quit about two weeks ago because she said, every time I put some conservative editorial together for the New York Times, which they hired me to do, they tell me they're never going to run something like that. And so she walked out the door. I, I, I couldn't live with that if I, if I were running the New York Times. But that's what's happened to me. You put your finger on one of the really uh, critical issues that the media faces and news gathering faces. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm old enough not to, to live and die on Twitter. But it amazes me how, I mean, you, you guys probably saw this huge uh, Twitter issue uh, yesterday and today about Dr. Fauci uh, making millions off of creating uh, flawed vaccines that give people COVID-19. I don't know if you did, but uh, millions of people in the United States see that and they believe it. And <laughs> I, I just wonder what country I'm living in. But you know what, Porter, if I can interject, I think that's a function of technology because at the end of the day, what has happened and what you're really discussing and talking about brings up the saliency of artificial intelligence. Yes. And that's kind of the issue because the byproduct of arti artificial intelligence is if you like this, you'll like that. So they're feeding those people who are, you know, thus it creates a division. And, and people will stay on their side because the the AI is saying, if you like this, you'll like that. So it keeps them you're absolutely in the wrong right. world. Yeah, you're 100% you're right. And I'm, I'm just waiting for the day when when reporters quit broadcast and, and print media because machines have got such strong algos and databases that they don't need a human to write the story. They know what the reader of that medium or the listener or viewer of that network is looking for and they can give it to them in spades. No, it's a scary, scary future. And to expand on that, so I'm 30 years old. Um, well, 31 to be exact. <laughs> Wait, my shoes so I would like to ask you um, how to Sorry, be, you know, <laughs> how to remain objective instead of being influenced um, by media to be subjective. That's that's a challenge. I, there is no easy answer because um, you, you could spend your life reading an array of, of competing media products and, and information sources and still not be objective and, and be able to form uh, a, a, a clear unbiased opinion. So everybody has to be on guard all the time now about what, what the source is and what the veracity of that particular story or, or opinion uh, has behind it. Um, I, I, I still think the only, only thing you can do is trust individuals on a face-to-face -face basis. Um, I was watching before we came on this afternoon here, watching William Barr testify in front of Congress. And, it was un unbelievable, the, the left and the right, the questions they asked. The right said, thank you, Attorney General, for saving America from going up in flames with all the, the liberals who were trying to destroy the country and wreck democracy. And then you listen to the Democrats question him about changing the laws, changing the, the sentences for people because Trump told them that guy is getting too many years and da 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 da, -da. And, I said, wait, wait, where's the rationality in all of this? And it's gone. 
we, we live in a world now that is so opinionated and, and so driven by AI uh, that it's it, it's hard to see what 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 it's going to look like 25 years from now. Let me before I uh, leave. Let me ask Porter a question. So in building upon that. Who's your go-to people to read when you read uh, what you think is quality uh, media? Who do, who do you read? I, I don't. I don't trust any one source. I read maybe four or five different papers every day, and about twenty or thirty magazines every week. And I listen. Uh, Alexandra kills me when, because she, she said, I, I can't stand to be in the room when you're watching television because I'm watching all of the news networks switching from, from network to network, story to story to see how they're covering the same issue. And th the answer is, I don't expect most people to do that. I'm, I, th this has been my life, the, being a reporter and being a, an editor and a, and a, and a journalist and a, and a media expert, so-called. Uh, but I just see it. Th th evaporating into entertainment and, and partisanship that uh, is, is really, really hard to understand what's, what's really happening, what's real, and what the implications could be. Well, Ira, I think you owe Porter um, your list of go-to people that you read. Well, I, I see, I, I would Porter. I first start with people I know I'm going to disagree with, but I have to see what they have to say because Maybe they can convince me because, again, Alexander, as you know, when I speak to this room especially, I say, you know, I'm not after validation. When I write, I'm not after validation. I'm looking at, I look at dialectic, intelligent dialectic, because that's how you learn. And if you're a trader, you don't want validation. Your views will be validated by the market. But right. so I like to be push back hard. So I want to read those who disagree. So the, when it comes to certain things that I will read, because they'll push, they'll push me, which is the reason I want to read. You know, I, I really love Ambrose Evans Pritchard. Because I it's like he wrote a piece the other day, I, I totally disagreed with, but it was laid out very intelligently and it was worth the read. I used to like some more of the FT people. Um, but a lot of good ones, as far as I'm concerned, have left. Uh, Ger Gerard uh, Baker, I used to really love, but then he went to the Wall Street Journal as an editor. And I, I don't know what he's doing now. I used to love to read Gretchen Morganson because I thought she was, she had the audacity to attack Wall Street, even as she lived in New York and wrote for the New York Times. Uh, but I always found, and this is not, uh, I'm not pandering, that female journalists in financial world were far better because they were outside the the old boys network. You know, so I, I've actually become friends with uh, Kathleen uh, Hayes at Bloomberg because she's so good and covered the bond market. Yeah, to it's say what you wanted to see, you know, what needed to be said. So I like people like that. I like those who really push people. And my daughter is sitting next to me who's a journalist at Bloomberg. And... Uh, I always, as she taught me, good journalists afflict the comforted and comfort the afflicted. So that's what I like to look for. Who's pushing and who, and who's really writing a story rather than just, uh, as we would say on the street, having a dime dropped on it to write a story. I, I, I like those who push hard. So th those are my, and I, you know, there, some disappoint me at times. Uh, John Authors at Bloomberg is really a good journalist, but uh, sometimes he get, and, and I wrote him a note the other day that I disagree. Oh, because when he, he he wrote a long piece about Wells Fargo, and he said, "Well, they're they're uh, what they did was misselling." And I I wrote him a piece. I said, "John, that's not misselling. That was that <laughs> that was fraud. That was identity theft. That's not misselling." Because he was lamenting yeah. how they got funded. Well, they deserved it. In fact, the fact that nobody went to jail bothered me. I'm like, so I look for people like that who are really not there at the behest of somebody, but actually pushing hard. Um, there's a woman, in fact, she has a piece out from Bloomberg. I read the Bloomberg stuff because I'm biased because uh, of my daughter. 
but Liz McCormick writes really good stuff. And there are certain people that I'll see that I will definitely gravitate to because I know I'm going to learn something. That it's just not one-sided. I, but I'm like Porter. I don't watch the media anymore. I can't. I, I can't stomach it because when I know what you're going to say before you say it, you're not reporting the news. You're giving me your opinion, and I already know your opinion. And there's nothing for me to learn there. So I'll spend my time scouring. You know, people are just lazy because you have at your fingertips unbelievable amounts of uh, of information if you're willing to do it. And that's what I spend my days doing, uh, putting together my views and knowing, uh, learning what I can learn about this, that, and the other. So that, and, and the fact here that we talked about the uh, Yi Gang uh, op-ed piece, nobody talked about it. It, it. it boggled my mind. And then I'll go back to the May 24, 25th piece, which I've talked about quite a bit, when Wolfgang Schweibel uh, absolutely pivoted in his stance on, uh, on a Euro bond and on giving grants to those who've been really highly affected. So when the most frugal person in Europe, a German, pivots, that's a huge thing to me. And yet nobody wrote about it. The FT had a small blurb, but nobody really picked up on it. And, and that's, that's a disheartening thing because I'm, I'm not as old as Porter, but you know, I go back to, in our house when I grew up, we got two men, we got Newsweek and Time in the mail. We got two newspapers every day. On Sunday, we got one newspaper because that was enough with all, and you would just get more of the information, but always, always reading all sides of an issue rather than just settling in. Because if I would have sat down at the table and, and said something of that opinion, they would have said that's acceptable, but defend it. And that's what you would have had to do. Now nobody defends anything. It's just my opinion is the way I feel. Well, the way I look at the world, it's not about the way I feel. If, if, if I did things by the way I feel, I would have been broke long ago. So uh, it's, uh, and I'd like to say I raised my, my own kids like that who, and I know I've done a good job with it because people, people my daughter Alexandra, who's a, really a good financial journalist, when, when people ask, where'd you learn what you learned? In fact, Rich Sander, Doc Sander, once had a long conversation with her, and he called me right after. He said, I didn't know your daughter did this. He said, it was the best interview I ever had. And he asked her, where did you learn? She said, well, at my dinner table. <laughs> so he had to call me right after. We had a good laugh about it. But, you know, that's, I, I have a son who was, they were going to throw him out of high school. He was so conservative. And now that he lives in Bethesda, I don't know who he is, but I, but I applaud the fact that he was open-minded enough to be conservative at that time in high school. And I had nothing to do with it, believe me. I, I come from a, a Marxist background and his conservatism kind of shook me at that age, but I applauded it because at least he was a free thinker. Ira, uh, let me make a brief paid political announcement after what you've said. I, I believe that Bloomberg Television, Bloomberg Radio, and Bloomberg Business Week are the best financial media in the business, but nobody else does. They they have such a minuscule audience on Bloomberg Television that it's not even rated by Nielsen. Their their radio is almost invisible uh, in terms of ratings and listenership, and the magazine is is struggling. Mike Bloomberg bought Business Week for one dollar but it, that's about what he would sell it for if he <laughs> decided to. And yet it's a re really, really interesting and well done publication. And I, I applaud all the people, the journalists uh, who work at, news, at, at Bloomberg because they're so unbiased and so good. And by the way, they, Bloomberg has 2,270 journalists around the world. That's more than twice any other news organization in the business. I feel the same as you, and that's without my daughter working there. But I just, and, and I had this conversation with Kathleen 20 years ago. And it's, you know, they've never wanted to cannibalize those machines. So they've always been kind of stuck. How good do you make it? Because if you make it so good, there are people who will get off the machines. So 
uh, you know, the, it's hard to, as as you know, you know as well as I, it's hard to serve two masters. That's right. And, and the television and radio has really suffered because I always say to my daughter, if they give me a shot at running the television, believe me, CNBC would be shut down tomorrow. Right. But they don't, you know, they don't want to do it. They just because uh, I. It, it is first. Bloomberg is the is the largest data aggregator in the world, and they go way beyond finance in, into law, into government, into medicine, into agriculture. And I, I every time I'm sitting with anybody of any consequence at News at Business Week or at Bloomberg, I say, "When are you guys going to start selling that data?" over the internet and, and Mike won't let them do much more than dribble a few little pieces of information out because he's still fixated on the, on the terminal. And yeah, I can't, I, it's when he, when done he, very well. When he's not there, of course it's done. <laughs> and, and you know, who can fault him? On the other hand, when Mike is not running the company, you're going to see an explosion of data on the internet and Newsweek, I mean, Biz Bloomberg is going to be two or three times as big a company as it is today when that happens. I, I think you're, I think you're right because then he'll have gotten all he could out of the other end. And you yep. know, a country needs a quality news organization like Bloomberg, who at least people would respect for the news and not their bias. I'll, I'll put a word in for Kathleen Hayes, too. Uh, <laughs> I would agree with you. She's one of the, the, the most uh, credible journalists and, and interesting uh, reporters I've ever encountered. I, yeah, I'm with you. I, I think she's great. She's been great for, for a long time. Uh, and uh, it really, uh, she, she's, she, I, I, I used to get interviewed by her all the time. It's been a, it's been a while, but some of the best interviews I've ever done are with her because she knows how to ask the right questions. And you know, too, your, only, your interview is only as good as the people, that, your in, in, interlocutors, as we say, because yeah. they can get out what I'm really trying to say and understand it. So, uh, all right, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bump up. This has been a pleasure. Alexander, we're going to have to do this again, not you as well. Okay, guys, nice to meet you all uh, virtually and maybe if you if you weren't so chart addicted, I could see your faces. Porter, thanks a lot for your time. Hey All guys, right. by the way, what we'll do is we'll do this again. But I think what we'll do is maybe put some questions together, and also um, Judd and I will be better moderators. We'll be prepared. We thought we would just kind of let this you guys sort of interact, but some of the technology got in the way. So um, let's do it again. Um, and we'll do it with an agenda next time. Great. Okay. Thanks. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ben. Turning over my spurs. <laughs>